Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wenamute, another Wenamute seminar talk. Um, a series of events that are sponsored by NTNU in partnership with University of Oslo and in collaboration with the amazing students and also teachers from the Master Music Communication and Technology. As a reminder of how this session works, we have three notes. One note is here in Trondheim. Uh, hello, Trondheim. <laughs> we have a second note, which is in Oslo, and the session is facilitated by Anne. Hello, Oslo and Anne. <laughs> <laughs> And we have a third note, which is more abstract, which are all the online viewers. Uh, may, and maybe we can ask Kaigel, hello, online viewers. Are they raising waving hands, maybe? <laughs> 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 so welcome, everybody. How it works. So we will have, uh, uh, we'll introduce the speaker, have the talk around 35 minutes, 40. And then we have time for questions around 20 minutes or so. So yeah. Uh, we hope it will be a nice conversation uh, with our speaker today. So I would like to introduce Liz Dobson, who is a National Teaching Fellow of the Higher Education Academy and Principal Enterprise Fellow in Music Technology and the, at the University of Huddersfield and also composer. Uh, Liz Dobson teaches modules in sonic arts and electronica, some for media, computer-based composition, and empirical research for musicians. She completed her PhD on social psychology and creativity in music technology education in 2012 at the Open University. Liz Dobson has founded and co-founded a number of initiatives, including Collab Hub and the Yorkshire, Yorkshire or Yorkshire, Sound Women Network with a high commitment with inclusive music technology education, in, particularly, uh, in particular supporting girls in music technology. We should thank the existence of the Wonomute Network and probably many other women's networks to Liz. We met in 2016 at Georgia Tech and thanks to her I realized how easy it is to be an active agent of change. The rest is history. Let's give a welcoming applause to Liz Dobson. Anna, thank you so much for such a wonderful welcome and for the, for the true honor of, of being able to come here and present to you today. Um, so I think Anna's sort of top and tail description really summarizes some of the things I'm going to talk about. But I, I'm going to take a bit of a diversion to start off with, because recently I was asked um, if, we, if we're really in control of our own lives. Now, that was obviously a, a huge question, and we don't have enough time to talk about that today. But as a sound artist or a musician working with technology or as a developer of audio technologies, you have probably felt the influence of your situation working simultaneously. So the, the equipment available uh, to your knowledge, your, your values, and how they drive your goals. And of course, your imagination, what you dream, what you imagine, shaping your choices in every moment of time. So I am interested in the interrelationships that constitute our actions in music technology, where technology is used, but in particular, the role of social interaction around the use of technology in each moment and over time. In the emergence of practice and creativity but especially how this situation relates to human development and a continuous moment by moment interrelationship between human development and context for us as individuals and collectively. So I'm going to begin by tracing a line through our um, experience, ec education, social psychology theory um, onto some real initiatives that were designed to improve the possibility of collaborative learning especially in music technology, um, but especially for young artists who are trying to establish themselves, find a voice, develop their portfolio, but also for women and people not typically associated um, with music technology purely because of gender. I'll come back to that shortly. Um, looking back through my own life, and I hope you'll indulge me, um, I can see how exposure to, to equipment has, has sort of provided a scaffolding for me to climb through. So I'm going to 
entertain you with a few, oh, there we go. A few examples from my own sort of youth, if you like. Starting with the Ghetto Blaster, which sound, sounds amazingly street. Well, I thought so at the age of very little. Um, the kind of thing you saw on television. Um, it, was, um, it was my sequencer, it was my mixer, my sampler. I was recording my family with this in secret, making funny noises with the tape, uh, recording the top 10 on the radio, uh, recording the piano, so recording on one side and then playing that back and recording onto the other side whilst I add another piano line until really it was just a lot of noise. Um, without this toy, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. Then we were introduced to this, which um, is an air-based organ. Um, it confused me to have one single key that would play whole sounds, whole clusters of sounds, but it made this amazing whooshing air sound as well. And um, I spent many happy hours just messing about with these two things. And then my father said, um, here's the, the record player, here's the sil stylus, whatever you do, you mustn't touch the stylus. So you say that to an eight-year-old and you know what's going to happen. I thought, I've got, I've got grooves on my finger. These records have grooves on them. I wonder what kind of sound it makes. And I think this is, this is the part that comes from within. I wonder what kind of sound it makes. Um, it didn't make a very nice sound, and my father didn't make a very nice sound, and he continues to make that sound now, because it cost him 50 pounds in the 80s. That was a lot. Um, around seven, eight years old, this magic machine arrived, um, and some interesting things started happening for me in terms of this scaffolding. Um, I was able to copy code from a magazine that would play a melody. I could appropriate the code um, to change the melody, and then I could talk about it to somebody else. So I was starting to develop a new set of cognitive skills around coding, all because of my interest in music. So this was a kind of improvisation with technology. Um, and also there was this brilliant cassette loading system. Um, just uh, for those of you who will recognize this, You set it up and have your dinner and come back. And, oh. So, yeah, it's a sort of um, psychedelic audio visual experience to be having and um, this was a mesmerizing thing for a young person and pretty typical for somebody with my sort of privileges and experience at that time. Of course, then we have MIDI, uh, which arrived, and we could, we could use a keyboard to sequence sound and the BBC computer um, to organize that. And then, of course, at school, we had something a bit like this, which was a coding environment for, for compiling a representation of a score. Um, it wasn't this one because I left school in 94. So if anyone knows a, an older uh, version of this, then I would love to know what it was. But this one's called Lily Pond. So coding in some interesting ways was part of my childhood and something that I wasn't afraid to try. And actually, today everything is presented in this very easy to access way uh, that facilitates composition, the most direct line to composing. Um, so the landscape for learning is completely different, in some ways simplified, in other ways very exploded. Um, and this has implications for how the brain is developing in music over time. These computer-mediated creativities, as Pam Bernard would say, develop the mind, of course, but I'm interested, as I say, in the social interactions, so interface also. But what happens around music technology practices and the relationship between that and human development with technology? Interested in... Um, Collaborative learning with music technology, an interest that really took hold when I, when I moved to my first job in Scarborough, just to give you a bit of sense where that is. So Scarborough College, or University College Scarborough at the time, was a, a small campus um, in Yorkshire um, where uh, we had a small department teaching creative music technology, and in the same building we had dance and art as well. Um, and we developed a module for teaching um, collaboration, so music technology and dance students coming together 
but they had uh, different kinds of investments. So they, they were highly invested in establishing their voices. They were very vulnerable in that respect and also wanted to do really well on the module, which required interpreting the, the staff requirements for that as well. Sadly, um, while some students did really well, not all of them did well because of the collaboration. And it got me on to wondering, what are they really learning? So are they learning how to co-create work? how to interpret academic assessment criteria, navigate group dynamics, or how much they just disliked collaboration and they were never going to do it again based on just that one experience. Um, so as, a, as a, an educationalist, I became interested in this aspect and I discovered Catherine Tech's Music for the Dance, Reflections on Collaborative Art, a text that includes interviews with very high profile composers and dancers and choreographers, conductors and performers. Um, and that led me on to discover Vera John Steiner's work, which has a more of a temporal aspect to it. So she looks at um, meaningful relationships that evolve over longer periods of time um, and also has developed a lovely set of models so that you can understand fleeting as well as long-term relationships in collaboration uh, where skills are very divergent or where they overlap. So it's a good starting point, it's a good access point for understanding uh, collaboration. Um, so after a while, I decided, so several years later, I decided uh, it would be interesting to, to go to university and study this. Having, having done my previous training in music, I went to the Open University and said I'd like to do a PhD. Um, I found a professor and they said go away and learn about social sciences and education action research. So I did that and I came back um, and started a, a PhD which eventually took seven years. But the, this work has that preface because it's important to understand the context of what happened next. The PhD was eventually called an investigation of the process of interdisciplinary creative collaboration in the case of music technology students working within the performing arts. And the core question was how the process of collaborative creativity is mediated by social and cultural contextual resources in small group multidisciplinary creative practice over time. It's more of a mouthful to say it out loud than it's just to read it in your head. Um, this breaks down into sub-questions. The first being um, focusing on the process of meaning making, this idea of uh, collaboration requiring us to understand what each other are, are doing, but also developing meaning jointly. So the first question was, how do undergraduates negotiate and renegotiate common knowledge, shared meaning, and a collective understanding of their interdisciplinary collaboration, um, collaborative creating over time. The second question focuses on the interrelationship with the physical tools, as I've just been explaining. So how are co-constructed processes of collaborative creating mediated by the concrete tools and resources? Um, and how is talk in particular um, implicated in the genesis and negotiation of ideas and creative work over time. So what, what is the role of talk in this? These questions come from a, a socio-cultural perspective on human development. Um, it comes essentially from Lev Vygotsky and his subsequent work on, or subsequent work on social-cultural theory and or otherwise known as cultural historical psychology. Vygotsky's emphasis was on genesis, the evolution the genesis of the human mind in relationship with the world and how this emerges through interrelationships with social and cultural environments. He says, to encompass in research the process of a given thing's development in all, it all its phases and changes from birth to death fundamentally means to discover its nature, its essence, for it's only in movement that the body shows what it is. And I like this because of, it reminds me of dance and in order to understand human activity, he was really uh, progressive in developing this, co this concept of really observing children, especially in their natural environment and uh, observing how things are relating to each other. So I developed a longitudinal study, which is grounded in this concept of social cultural theory on collaborative computer-based music composition. Um, that I was meant to click the slide. So the, those are the tools. Psychological tools um, for Vygotsky especially were talk, language, language being the psychological tool uh, for cognitive high mental development. 
So for example, when I'm coding with the, the computer and then going away and trying to explain it, as I'm doing now, to somebody else, that's requiring me to utilize an appropriate and reappropriate language. So this works the same in terms of uh, domain concepts, musical concepts, utilizing them, reappropriating them culturally and individu individually. And then also concrete tools comes later. So um, our interrelationships with concrete environments is part of the social cultural um, understanding and investigation. So there we go. I set up a longitudinal study um, the, in 2008, I recruited students from a cohort of final year creative and performing arts undergraduates enrolled on a single term project in collaborative creativity. Um, they had to develop a, a project, and in their case it was a film, a piece of dance film, 10 minute film. Um, they were working with dance and film, but also surround sound for this project. And one of the composers understood ambisonic sound and the other composer didn't. So there was a lot of work that they had to do around that. Um, these were the, the physical spaces they worked in. Um, so that it included social spaces and studios. And because of this, they, co they collected the data for me. So they used their phones and handheld cameras and they collected 20 hours. Um, well, they collected all of their recordings throughout an entire term, which I then moved, um, analyzed down to 20 hours of meaningful data that I could use for analysis on this project. Um, I approached the data by conducting an initial discourse analysis to explore relationships between talk and the ecology, the emergence of their project. So what we see here, um, this is a, a very, this is, well, it's a 29-minute conversation <laughs> that you can see here, and I used three headings to try and categorize the areas of focus amongst their in their conversation. So the top area is to do with uh, the topics that they were talking about in relation to the development of the project, so creative ideas. Um, and then underneath that, the educational context, the process, so the more logistical concerns. And then underneath that, moments where they seem to be trying to seek out more information, engage in meaning making. So what you see is they started by looking at the project and asking, what, well, what have we got to do here? And they started defining their roles. Um, and where you see the first arrow that's going down um, here, they, they stop talking about roles and they start explaining a bit more about themselves and that progresses on to talking about creative ideas. So this is a little bit abstract at the moment because you can't see what they're actually talking about. Um, but it gave me enough confidence to realise that I could conduct quite an extensive thematic analysis, not only to look at this patterning, but also to identify what the, the priority topic was in order to analyse that and focus on that. Um, the analysis um, utilized various kinds of discourse analysis. Um, first of all, a technique developed um, to reveal how they were using their resources. So I've been talking about different kinds of tools. Um, I was interested in how they use those tools for meaning making. Um, so here's a... Uh, the work came from Marit Aravaya's uh, work on understanding resources for meaning making actually in a project looking at history students using a computer to understand what they were developing together. Um, and the, the context of, of resource that they might use include the local social context of the history of the group, uh, knowledge about the tutor, the physical environment that they're working in, and references to the social and cultural uh, context, so wider concepts like the collaboration between Most Cunningham and John Cage, for example. Um, in this short, short extract from quite a lot of data, uh, we see an example of how imagination is also a resource for meaning making. Um, and quite often in this collaboration, we found the students were talking about hypothetical scenarios in music technology they'd never experienced before because they worked on different systems, different doors. Um, they had a very different understanding of what they were doing. So in this context, he's, one of the students is suggesting how they might develop sounds and put them together. So he's imagining it verbally and he's imagining a hypothetical future conversation. Um, so he says, um, 
there's going to be instant sound assignment in our own heads, so sound assignment for the film. Um, I might like that one bit, and I'll say, ah, oh, I like that, I could do that there. And you might say, so he's even telling the other person what you're going to say, uh, well, in that case, this will work really well at that point. And then, well, we're going to decide quite quickly, I think, then you should do that sort of sound. And he goes on, uh, then try and make our stuff gel, then work, and then come back. And what he's describing here is a completely unproblematic sort of conversation and he suggested it will be very democratic as well. So he, he's got a particular idea about how conversation might work around their collaboration. Of course, conversation is like an improvisation, as Keith Sawyer might describe it as distributed creativity and collaborative emergence because contributions are contingent on each other. You can't tell where something is going because it's contingent on what has just happened and what's coming next when it's distributed. Um, so that was one technique that I used. I, I wanted to understand what resources they were using. And in this case, we have imagination. Uh, but I also coded every single interaction uh, with a function. So this is interaction analysis. Uh, so where somebody was suggesting something, I'd code it with an S saying it's suggested, uh, where, uh, with slightly more refinement where it was creating a suggestion about the creative project itself or just the process. Um, supporting something, expressing concern, and then further down, confirming, agreeing, or something else. So you could start to get a flow, a sense of how the conversation is operating, what the quality of the conversation is like. Um, and also, I was able to identify episodes of talk with particular characteristics in relationship with the outcome and the activity. Um, so drawing on Neil Mercer and Karen Littleton's work on dialogue, uh, where they they characterize different kinds of talk. So disputational talk is characterized by very short iterations like no or non-response. Um, exploratory talk may be um, where somebody is, is offering a suggestion, someone disagrees, but they build on it and it's constructive and exploratory. And then cumulative might be a kind more like a bland sort of yes and, and yes and, and yes and. So we can start to see those kind of things happening across the map of the collaboration. Um, and actually, it, see, it said that exploratory talk is more educationally valuable, and you could sort of see why. Um, in this episode, um, we've got a situation where the composers are working with the computer, and they're playing sounds. One of them's asking where, where the certain sounds are, and they're trying different things out, and it's quite exploratory in nature. Um, and then a bit of time passes. We don't see, because we haven't got the timeline on this transcript. Um, but then... Uh, Liam doesn't really respond. He's, it becomes a bit more disputational in quality. And there's an intervention there because of the technology, basically. So because he's working on the technology, he's decided he's doing something else. And you can start to see how these th sorts of things are intersecting. So essentially, the findings showed that the ways in which technology mediated collaboration is a complex interactional accomplishment when students are navigating different thinking spaces over time, so working together and working separately over time, um, engaging in post-dialogic activity, so personal work, and also talk offering insights into private remote moments of creativity. Um, that collaborative digital music practices do foster possibility thinking, to use Anna Kraft's concept, as collaborations explore hypothetical future activities and that digital music technologies do not need to be present to affect mediated composition practice. So they don't need to be present to be shaping the composition flow. It means that the computer is still mediating practice when it's imagined and when it's remembered. So returning to the impulse for my, my work and, and trying to create better situation for collaboration, um, as talk is important for higher mental development and as collaboration in computer-based music practice is a complex international accom accomplishment that stimulates possibility thinking and different kinds of creativities, and as young artists need opportunities to develop confidence in their practice, especially according to John Steiner and Holbrook Mann who talk about the gift of confidence through collaboration, and as undergraduate students find themselves competing for marks rather than cooperating as Susan Orr's work articulates, I decided to create an extracurricular collaboration sand pit based on a model um, to support collaborative learning. So 
The model wasn't presented this way previously, but it is now. Um, so the idea here is to lower the stakes. In this case, it was to remove formal assessment, um, to create platforms. So the students aren't doing the project that we want them to do. They're creating the projects they want to do away from assessment. Uh, develop community, which fosters collaboration, personal agency, and build confidence to take risk. So it sort of flows around. The model was put to practice really in uh, Collab Hub, promoting multidisciplinary collaboration across the university and across different communities. Anyone could join Collab Hub. Um, and I've, I've put some reference to the book chapter down there so you can find out a bit more about how students were learning and thinking about their practice in Collab Hub because I undertook some interviews about that. And there was a lot, of, a lot more metacognitive engagement with themselves, experiencing m multiple collaborations rather than just one and working out how they operate as professionals um, and not, no longer students. Um, it led to spin-off projects and enterprise creativities, new business initiatives and social enterprise initiatives. Um, and really it was successful in fostering the kind of learning that I was hoping for many years ago. A few years later, I became rather more preoccupied by the situation of gender imbalance in music technology. And I'm not going to provide um, a presentation about the statistics on this because um, we, there's a lot of research already that has done that now. So if you want to really see the magnitude and the scale of um, gender imbalance in music technology, you could look to um, the gender research in Darmstadt. You could look at Georgie Bourne's presentation on the website, the female, female pressure facts surveys, um, the most recent Annenberg report on inclusion in a recording studio, and the Yorkshire Sound Women Network, which really focuses on Yorkshire and the balance in terms of gender and music technology there. Um, but uh, Bourne and Devine's work back in 2015, when this began, uh, really showed that looking at 38 degree courses over a period of a 10 year period, when there was a boom of 1,400% in applications through UCAS to music technology degree courses, 90% of those students were, were guys. And that's the industry that we're now facing. So all of those statistics are there. Um, Sarah Ahmed asks, if a, world, if a world can be what we learn not to notice, noticing becomes a form of political labor. What do we learn not to notice? I've been teaching music technology since 1998, and I sort of been willfully not noticing this until 2015 and decided that I was going to do my thing and try and do something about this. The first thing I did was I wanted to check my assumptions, so I did some interviews in Berlin with um, 18 women and non-binary people, musicians, DJs, producers, electroacoustic composers even. And these, compo these conversations led me on to thinking about Bourdieu's theory of fields and capital, social capital, cultural capital, economic capital, and really how dis multiple layers of disadvantages that women and diverse women face by not having that, that access to community. Um, following the impact of Collab Hub and what that had enabled, I decided to basically I put out a tweet and invited other like-minded people to come together and see what, what could be done. Um, we had the first meeting of um, the Yorkshire Sound Women Network in 2015, and women came from all over, um, well, they came from Staffordshire, Yorkshire, all over Yorkshire, basically. Um, the ethos of the Yorkshire Sound Women Network um, is to foster collaboration, access to equipment, access to people, lower risk, and build community and networking that supports agency. Um, I'm going to take you to the website so you, you have a bit of a context on what we're doing at the moment. Quite quickly, we found that people wanted to have meetings more local to them. So a group set up in Sheffield. So they, they were a sort of spin-off and they started organizing. And you can find out more about all of these groups on the website. We have um, a Calderdale group, which is closer towards Manchester. They're very active. We even had 
a group start in Malta. Um, so we're having a bit of international influence as well. Um, you can find out more about the kinds of things that we do on our website, but to give you a bit of a context, we've had over 100 meetings across those networks, and across those groups. Um, it's become a community interest company with five directors and an administrator, thanks to the University of Huddersfield, uh, a development manager, thanks to the University of Huddersfield, Heidi Johnson, who's had a really significant impact on strategic work and sustainable growth of the organization, particularly around fundraising and partnerships. Um, we were able to develop a short advocacy film and print materials to, to promote positively the need for inclusive mindset and practical things that studios can do. Um, we received funding to, we've delivered five full day long events, but three of those uh, level up events, one still to come, are designed around supporting professional development in music practice and promotion and self career development, three industry internships and six shorter youth music funded internships, two music technology clubs, one of them in Leeds and one in uh, Doncaster. The one in Leeds is, is ongoing right now. And so they have a cohort of girls coming every week for 12 weeks and, and learning music technology. Um, we're delivering workshops around 20 schools in Yorkshire on tour. Um, and we also delivered 20 workshops for girls in collaboration with Sound and Music, um, a national organization who've really helped us to do this. So those workshops ran over last year and this year for over 50 girls, giving them all that first impulse, that, that improvisation with technology and helping them to find their way with the technology. Uh, we've managed to secure funding from the Arts Council, further funding from the Arts Council to support regional groups of women who are coming together and want their own agency to develop their own projects. Um, but they just need some funding to do that. Um, we've done consultancy for Spotify. We're on the EQL directory, which is um, set up as a directory set up of professional women um, in audio specifically um, to make women more visible and therefore easier to find and then employ. Um, and several organisations have taken the audio equity pledge hashtag. If you go to find that online, you'll find a, a series of guidelines about how to make environments more inclusive for women and girls. Um, and also various artist residences, such as one in collaboration with Mark Fell and another collaboration with Electric Spring with uh, Lauren Sarah Hayes and Electric Indigo. So these collaborations and partnerships are a really important part of our portfolio of work. A survey that we delivered has shown that the, the people in the community um, are really benefit because they're taking up new interests that they've never taken up before and they're gaining in confidence um, in new areas, especially around starting groups, fundraising and skill sharing and starting new projects for girls especially. Um, and YSWN has a pool of paid associates, so these are women that when we are approached to say we'd like to employ a woman, we say, okay, well, we've got this pool of people um, and we've managed to um, spend over £9,000 on those people uh, to be employed to deliver work um, in music technology. Um, in 2020, I'll be delivering some webinars really on the, the model that I showed earlier because there's a, there's a lot more around that, or especially around uh, lowering risk in specific classroom situations in music technology and, and fostering collaborat collaborative learning. So I'll be doing those webinars then and also on how to start up new groups. Um, and anybody interested in starting a new group, um, it, is, it is difficult, it is time consuming and it requires a lot of collaboration and, and careful, thoughtful sustainability work. Um, but I want to show you um, one of the things that I'm most proud of, which is uh, a short film. It's only about three minutes. And it, I think it really captures the energy and the aims of the organisation beautifully. So enjoy. <laughs> Has anybody done any music technology before? I think the key thing that we've done today is to give them hands-on with equipment. Basically like a string vibrates with antinodes and codes. And things that maybe are a little bit, they might think it's a little scary or they're not allowed to use or whatever. Music technology today is about making It's a lot about building confidence that not only can they do it, but it's okay for them to do it. I 
and you're going to finish the day with a performance of your noise toy that you have built yourself. We haven't ever like put one together. Yeah, we haven't made one from scratch before. Not really done much things like that before. Well, I won't spoil it, but it's going to sound like a racket by the end of the day. <laughs> As they sort of began the process and began soldering the first few parts and things and they got the hang of it, I think they were, you did see an urge for them to, to help their neighbours. Everybody got it all working in the end, so I'm really pleased about that. <laughs> We've done a pretty good job first time round. They'll hopefully go away, look back upon this, maybe when they're making other decisions in the future. something else now is it so when I think about my childhood um, and everything that I was exposed to and that sense of being in the sandpit and playing and all of, all of that afforded for me I think that's what I'm trying to say here is that this is oh I can't get out uh, this is what's happening for them hopefully that they're they're discovering through their relationship and their access to technology um, and they're, they're gaining confidence through that. They're, they're working out where they can be in music technology and they're learning. Um, but it's fun. It's so important. These projects are so incredibly important. Um, through the Yorkshire Sound Women Network activities, I've made a lot of friends, um, built up a lot of relationships, and um, it's been an incredibly steep learning journey for me personally. Um, I've developed new research looking at... Um, uh, a multimodal social semiotic analysis of the sociality of music technology with a focus on markers of engagement and confidence gain. So I'm interested not only in dialogue now, but how young people who don't really speak very much use multiple modes to communicate with each other and how that relates to their engagement with music technology. Um, and also the Yorkshire Sound Women Network really gave me the sort of gift of confidence to explore my own interest in synthesis. Uh, so this is another sort of relatively new strand for me, um, exploring modular synthesis um, and composing an instrument with my dreams, um, which, which was really to, to be able to play the modular with, with my violin. So with the help of uh, Delta Sound Labs and the, the control unit here um, and Owen Green, and uh, Ricky Graham from Delta Sound Labs as well. I was able to develop a Max Patch that actually does 
respond to me playing the violin. And it's a kind of magical experience. Well, it was the first time it worked. This was on residency at QO2 during the summer, an incredibly hot month, um, in a beautiful space with some brilliant support. Um, I'm just going to play you a little extract from this. enough of my out of tune playing you can handle. I've got a um, brilliant violinist, Irene Rosner's at uh, Huddersfield University. She's doing her PhD in violin electronics and she's excited about working with me on this and we're developing this together. But basically I want to say I'm, I'm still in the sand pit um, and exploring these interrelationships all the time and uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Liz, for such an inspirational talk. And we can start the round of questions. Maybe we can do it sequentially, starting in Trondheim, moving to Oslo, and then online viewers. So, Trondheim, any questions? <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> 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 or you can think a little bit. We can ask Oslo, Oslo, Oslo. Anne? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Hello. I was very interested in your very last uh, thing that you were showing with the next patch and uh, the cool. uh, process in violin playing. I'm wondering if you could just describe very briefly what parameters you're uh, are, are using for figuring or how the response is in the next patch. Yes, for sure. Um, this is Oslo, right? This, yes. This camera. So I'm talking <laughs> to you here. <laughs> um, so um, I was sent an object called Helmholtz, which follows the pitch and helps to identify one frequency that is useful. And what I'm doing then is that frequency is sent out to the control module, um, and it can be sent either as a, a gate on off or a continuous control voltage signal. And I'm sending that to, I'll show you the synth. Um, so you see on the left, um, that's turning on and off the uh, envelope, which I can use elsewhere to control the wave, the, the, the volume of the sound, the envelope of the sound. But on the right hand side of control, uh, this is sending the control voltage to different oscillators over here. Now in the max patch, I can set this up so that any frequency I play on the violin, um, sends the same frequency, the same signal to all of those oscillators. And then, of course, I can pitch them to the same frequency or I can pitch them wherever. Uh, but there's also a setting where I play um, harmonic A on the A string, um, and that will tell the patch to split the signal so that uh, frequency below 440 hertz um, only goes to one of the outputs. A frequency which is on the A string, basically, the violin, will go to one of the other oscillators, one of the outputs and then higher notes to another one, which means I, I can choose which string I'm playing on in order to change um, the relationship between the tones that are resulting from the oscillators. Uh, very simply, the, the knocking on the violin is uh, to create a, la a sudden loud noise, uh, which is being used to, to trigger the freeze on the clouds, which is a granular synthesizer, so it, it freezes the signal until I knock it again, so you can hear that. I don't know how effectively it, it's working just yet, but um, you can probably see from the look on my face that this isn't always working as anticipated, but this is the, the really beautiful thing about it is that, sent, that, that balance between knowing what's going to happen and sometimes not really being completely sure uh, is really lovely. 
Um, that's about as much as I can say at this point. If that does that answer your question? Yeah, we have one more question in, in Oslo. Of course. As, uh, thank you. Hi. Do you hear Hello. me? Yes. As a father to a five-year-old daughter, I wanted to ask uh, how old were the girls in the video? And what's your experience with the younger or much younger kids oh, wow. and girls? And uh, music technology. Thank you. The girls in the video were around 11. Uh, the Go Compose summer school, that was aged 11 to 16. But really, we had mostly 11-year-olds coming. Music is really part of their identity at that age as well, so they might not they might not identify with um, performing or singing music, but they might connect with working behind the mixing desk, so they find their own place. I don't have a lot of experience with much younger children, but all I would say is, um, not I wouldn't hold back in terms. Of, you know, obviously you don't want things broken, but in terms of experience, the, the, you know, the younger they are, the more hungry they are for experience and to try things and. Um, there's a lovely piece of research, I'm trying to remember the author, it's not coming to mind right now, which is a, a spiral of musical development. I might try and post it later. Um, and it really shows how when children are really young, they're, they're very interested in generally the sound and the vibration, the experience of sound. And of course, that doesn't matter if it's music technology or not. Uh, but if they're really used to it in their environment, then as they're growing up, they're going to continue to experiment and develop competencies and understandings without necessarily needing to have a technical knowledge about what's going on. So I would just say exposure is everything. So long as it's not going to get broken. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. We have a question here in Trondheim. Hi, I'm Tune. Uh, you talked about uh, how the interface is present in our minds, you know, on when we think about what to do, the technology is uh, is there, you know, uh, on a meta level. Yeah. So did you find, because when you, you looked at these conversations, uh, and also it's interesting if you have some thoughts about those little girls, in, in what situations does uh, this collaboration kind of uh, challenge the technology and think about things that cannot really be done? with how we experience technology today and kind of look further or think about the impossible or mm. do you have any observations? I think it's important to be, to define, sort of use definitions of creativity which mm. sort of pin down what we're talking about a little bit. So um, we might talk about little c creativity, so personal creativity mm. um, in the sense that uh, something that a child does for the first time is new for them and it might demonstrate divergent thinking or uh, a sort of novel output that they've never created before. Mm. Um, but then big C creativity is sort of this global innovation. So, uh, you know, a team like they have here might produce some enormous substantial development in music technology. What we're, what we're really um, hoping for is little C creativity uh, to be fostered and group collaboration can, can really nurture that. And, and so in, in terms of the composers, the music technology composers, we have one composer who understands Amazonics audio and the other composer doesn't. So there were lots of examples of them teaching each other, um, but also having these hypothetical conversations. So we could use Max for this and then drilling into what, what does that actually mean in practice and literally explaining, well, well, we'll have this sound file and we'll move it here in this format, but we've got A format and we, sorry, we've got B format and we've got stereo and how does that work in practice? So they're teaching each other and this, if you like, uh, Vygotsky talks about a zone of proximal development for a child, which is this um, area, the scaffolding through which the, the a more experienced person makes it possible for a, t a child to learn themselves. Um, but I think it was Neil Mercer that talks about an intermental development zone. So the students are creating that for each other and it's more horizontal. Yeah. Um, so they're creating, it's, it's not as um, structured necessarily, but um, I did see lots of examples of them trying to find solutions to problems jointly, like a jazz improvisation where you, you couldn't know the outcome beforehand. Yeah. And that's what Keith Sawyer's work is all about. So there was lots of evidence of that. Yeah. Um, I was going to add something else. That one of the things they did, that w which was really interesting, is they, they couldn't structure their project because they had a film, but they didn't actually have the actual film. They, they were told they were going to write for a film, but it wasn't ready yet. And so they had to make this soundtrack, and their deadline was pressing. So the problem here was how to co-compose a soundtrack for a film that doesn't really quite exist, but they can remember previous 
uh, moment of watching excerpts being filmed. They've got piece a jigsaw puzzle. So what they did was um, they created these really abstract graphs um, over time. They sat down over five minutes and they each drew what they imagined the sort of intensity of the project might be. So they ended up with this pile of graphs and then they looked at each other and sort of said, what does that mean? So it's a completely ambiguous representation of sound that they, they developed, but it enabled them to talk so, and, and develop and, and move forwards. So in, in a socio-cultural context, we might appropriate existing tools, but in this context, they were creating tools that they were then appropriating for meaning making. Um, it's a very rich sort of area, and, and this is why I'm really interested in the, the, the social interactions around not just with the technology. Because uh, when they're working on their own, that, that description of what happens remotely, it provides a window into personal creativity they might not otherwise even explain to anybody else. Mm. Uh, and that, in turn, is, is making them think about what they were doing remotely as well. So it's, it's really, really rich and interesting. Um, yeah. Did you observe something that could stop these creative processes? You know. Like recognize, okay, I know this is happening again. Someone is saying, no, this won't work. Or did, did you? Because of the, the way they were recording, I told them they could turn off the, the recorder whenever they liked. Mm. Um, and even though I did a lot of theoretical work on conflict, um, I didn't include that much in my PhD because it wasn't there in the data because they turn the recorders off. Mm. Um, but you did see occasional moments where maybe the technology failing or a disagreement about logistics, maybe sending them on a different trajectory. Mm. It's m it was more about the trajectories, I think, than stopping as such. But yeah. We have another question. Uh, hi, I'm Robin. Uh, I have just one question regarding uh, the setup we have now. I mean, cross uh, distance, cross collaboration. Uh, over distance, do you see any limitations or, or challenges if you should use the same way of collaborating or using technology and, and uh, Vygotsky, Vygotsky's uh, thoughts? I'm afraid I don't understand the question. No, I mean, uh, do you think this is possible uh, cross campus as well, this kind oh. of collaboration and, and uh, or do you see any limitations in, in, in the, uh, how we can work together? I haven't tried it and I haven't researched it, so I, I couldn't really say, but um, in terms of collaboration verbally over Skype, um, purely subjectively, I would say that when you can't see somebody and you can't see their expression and you don't have multiple ways of, of communicating and trying things and, and everything available quickly, when it's just a voice, it shuts a lot down. Um, so I think that Possibly, the, the biggest possible range of uh, what you can share would enable the most normal or the most situated, collaborative, natural. I mean, you, you see this happening in music improvisation a lot already um, through different sites. But I think that the more you can take away that feeling of separateness, it possibly would be uh, a benefit. That's a, just a conjecture though. Mm. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions in Oslo? No? Okay, yeah, well, question in Trondheim. Yeah, hi Liz. Um, just wondering what happened in uh, 2015 that made you kind of realize that you needed to do the work with the Yorkshire Sound Women Network? And um, just like your words, um, why do you feel that that work is important? Um, for just centuries, a particular demographic of people have been so prominent and simultaneously so many other people are sort of hidden and they, they don't really have the same access to each other or the same access to uh, equipment, the economy of the university. Um, the, these ideas about capital, social capital, um, 
being able to climb through to, to gain symbolic capital and be representative in a genre, be a high profile DJ, many, many barriers and uh, challenges if you're not the, the person that people normally expect to see. Um, there are lots of issues around that to unpack, but I, I believe in um, um, equity of opportunity and that we don't all start with the same starting points. Um, and intersectionally, I haven't talked about, uh, you know, I'm a white, cis, able-bodied woman, um, and I haven't touched on that at all. And it's really opened up my awareness of how those multiple layers of uh, challenge uh, lead to a leaky pipeline, to more people moving away. So the, the creative industries are worth something like, in the UK, 10 billion a year. Um, the creative industries include so many careers in audio, audio engineering, composition for film, signal processing, development of our interfaces that we're using. Um, and if the same people are doing all of those things, not only are they economically be benefiting, so we have the um, amplification of the same, uh, but we're not open to the possibilities of other, other things that might be happening or what these girls might be developing in a few years' time may be completely different. We don't know. But we don't get the chance to know. Um, and also, they don't necessarily have the, the benefits of finding out how to get a career. In, why, why shouldn't they? Um, so that was bothering me, and that's why I felt that this, this idea of bringing community and these ideas together was showing that it could bring confidence to just... Um, help and of course if you are the if you're always the only uh, person like you at a conference or in a studio space for some people it's fine for more people it's not and eventually it's like water eroding a cliff it just the cliff will fall and it, there's no way to continue it's too much um, so when you bring those people together and they can decompress and then they can start to just un unselfconsciously engage in music technology and do what they want to do, do what we want to do, without having to think about all of that. It's not a completely safe space. It can't be always, but um, it just low, it just reduces the, those risks enough for people to get hands on, make a loud noise, ask the question, and get back into those spaces with some resources. And then hopefully this won't regress, and we'll see a seismic change there are lots of organizations doing this sort of work, especially here too. Yeah. Um, just one more uh, thought. Uh, how do you feel about the fact that often it is the uh, minorities themselves who already have that burden, who has to like drag this thing along and uh, make that change? And I mean, it's a big burden in addition to the one you're already facing with yeah, absolutely. Um, if you decide to, to take this on, you're not doing something else, which is why I've come back to my synthesizer. Mm. That, that further disadvantages <laughs> the, the, the fundamental point of what you're doing, because you're not visible doing what you, what you were doing. Right. Um, I was asked once at a conference in Manchester, um, what can older women, more established women, do for young women coming into the, the scene? And... Um, I, I said no, nothing. You know, those people have kind of done enough. Really, it's a responsibility of the industries, all of these industries, together to take that responsibility, to mentor someone, to develop initiative, to change the language, to change the space so it's not uh, marginalizing people. Until the industry changes, we're going around in this circle. We're doing well, but I think it, the responsibility is on the, the systemic change, the bigger institutions mm. to do that work and I I call on them to do it yeah. thank you well food for thought thank you so much for being today with us today yeah thank you for having me yeah thanks, thanks.